I'm Chrissy Konomaki, publisher emeritus of National Speed Sport News, America's weekly motorsports authority for 60 years. The racing at Watkins Glen is an evolvement of the love of the automobile that many people had that manifested itself in the mid-1930s. Most of the lovers of cars fancied foreign cars and they imported cars from Europe and they get together and talk about their cars. They weren't really racing people, they were car lovers. And at that point, racing started to emerge. There was an Alexandria Bay race, um, the Auto Racing Club of America was formed, and they had events in the backyard of the Collier family in Briarcliff Manor, New York, on a dirt road. And that was really the beginning of the road racing movement in the United States, the second one in the early days, in the early days of the automobile, there were a lot of road races, but they faded away in favor of oval track racing, which became the big part of American automobile racing at fairgrounds and speedways throughout the country. But the ARCA, with its members who own cars brought from Europe, however, the first startling car that beat all the European cars was a Willys. It was fashioned after an Indianapolis car. and was driven by a New England college boy named Langdon Quimby. And he won the first Alexandria Bay race and, and did quite well in that car. And that was the nucleus of the formation of the Sports Car Club of America. In the meantime, these car lovers who came from all over the east, eastern part of the United States would form groups back in their own town and own county uh, and, and car lovers would get together. And sooner or later they said, uh, let's have a race. And, and that was how the racing at Watkins Glen came to be. We had some people up here in, in Watkins Glen who were very uh, well organized and, and they, were, they were doers more than talkers. And they got the first competition going on the streets of Watkins Glen. And of course, history tells us now what has happened. It's one of the finest race circuits in the entire world. And what it does, it draws the largest sporting crowd in the state of New York for the annual Winston Cup stock car race here at the Glen Circuit. So it's been a wonderful ride here at Watkins Glen for automobile racing and for sports cars. Sports car racing, unfortunately, has sort of fallen behind the professional form of racing preferred by most Americans, Indy cars and stock cars and so forth. But still, it's very, very engaging to those who participate. They're in it not to win races, not to make money, but to enjoy themselves and uh, really find out that their choice of a car is, is the right one. Every person that's involved in the sports car racing movement and the Watkins Glen race today is truly in love with his automobile. I got to th how you doing? That's great. All right, let me catch, turn it off for a minute. Okay. Let me, I wasn't here for the races on the street, but when that disc track opened, I was here. And I used to, there's one of those guys in the Auto Racing Club of America that I mentioned, uh, I, I was a friend of, and I used to go to some races with him. He had an MG, this is back in the 1936 and 37. Um, okay, let's go, let's, let's try some more here. The road racing movement got a big uptick in 1936 when a special course was built close to New York City at Roosevelt Field called Roosevelt Raceway. It was a zigzag course and it would be the home of the first international Grand Prix held in the United States since the days of the Vanderbilt Cup events at the turn of the century. That racetrack uh, was a disappointment in that it was too complex. Uh, there were too many turns and great speeds that New Yorkers expected to see never materialized. That was held on Columbus Day, 1936. I remember I took off from school to go watch. The following year, in July of 1937, uh, a race was scheduled on July 3rd, and it rained. And uh, unlike today, the race was postponed for two days and was held on the 5th of July. In the meantime, the track had been uh, changed markedly. A lot of the turns were taken out, and it was a high bank turn placed at one end. And the German cars, the auto unions and the Mercedes cars came with swastikas on the side, and of course at that time we didn't recognize the significance of that. These were Hitler's wagons, and he financed these cars and wanted them to dominate worldwide auto racing. 
And the Vanderbilt Cup race in 1936 was won by an Italian, Tazio Nuvolari, in an Alfa Romeo. And in 37, Vern Rosemeyer, a German, won in a rear engine auto union. And that sort of opened the eyes of the Americans to not only road racing, but more importantly, European cars. And the people who were interested in the Indianapolis 500 that fielded cars started looking to Europe for the racing machinery. And that led to Wilbur Shaw winning at Indianapolis before the war in the Maserati. And a lot of German cars came and other foreign cars. To this day, uh, the field in Indianapolis is made up of cars made in Europe as opposed to the United States. Getting back to Watkins Glen, the Grand Prix of the United States was ha first held in Sebring, Florida, and it was a financial disappointment. It moved then to Riverside, California, where again it was a financial disappointment. So the third shot at running the United States Grand Prix, it came to Watkins Glen, and thanks to people like Cameron Argett Singer, who was a very much a prime mover in the sport here. It was a success and continued to build to where it became a monumentally successful event. During the course of its tenure here, commercialism entered road racing. And the uh, cost of fielding a car became so high that sponsorship was an absolute requirement. And one of the things the sponsors wanted were luxurious accommodations. And for all of the positive aspects of the Watkins Glen Grand Prix circuit, there were no very good hotels and very few fine restaurants, and that's why the Grand Prix was dropped here for other locations in these United States. Sort of a strange excuse, but that's the real reason behind that move. So, but Watkins Glen continued to operate with uh, different forms of road racing. Sports cars came along. The uh, Canadian American Challenge Cup Series, sponsored by Johnson's Wax, was a fabulous racing series. It had a unique word attached to it that caught everyone's fancy, unlimited, unlimited sports car racing. The engine could be any size, the car could be anything, so long as it had two seats. And with that formula, allowing people to express themselves at the drawing board and in the shop with their welding torches and their engines, we saw some fabulous machines show up. The famous McLaren Group 7 cars with Chevy engines, the Porsche 917, the Chaparral vacuum car, and so forth. It was an intriguing period of time in American motorsports, and really it was headquartered here at Watkins Glen. People came from all over the country to see the Can-Am event held here. Other Can-Am events were held in Canada, and other circuits in the United States, but really the Glen was the, uh, the shining star of the Canadian American Challenge Cup Series. As time went on, uh, financial problems befell the circuit here, and it was forced to close. After a, a span of inactivity, the Corning Glass people felt, because the area was depressed, that the reopening of this racetrack might help the local economy. And they acquired the property, and recognizing the fact that they weren't racing people, they made a deal with the International Speedway Corporation, which operates the Daytona Beach Speedway, one in Talladega, Alabama, and, and now one in, uh, in Darlington, South Carolina, made an arrangement with them to come up here and provide, provide management expertise. And of course, that particular combination of Corning's local interest and the International Speedway Corporation's management professionalism has seen the Watkins Glen circuit uh, grow and improve to where it is now one of the premier racing circuits in the world. And as I said earlier, provides the largest sporting crowd in the history of New York State. How about that? Sounds good. In harking back to the early days of racing here at Watkins Glen, we, we really shudder uh, when we see the films of it because of the uh, apparent lack of concern for safety. The tires were skinny, the cars were fast, the brakes weren't all too good. There were trees on the side of the road, ditches, rocks, poison ivy, you name it. Uh, something would absolutely not be allowed to take place in this day and age with insurance considerations being what they are. So these men that raced, and women too, that raced in those days were really taking tremendous chances with their lives and their equipment on the road. Uh, the road was high camber, uh, and, and things like that today, would drivers would just turn their back on that racing circuit today. And remember, there was no prize money. You got, as we used to say, a trophy and a hearty handshake when you won one of those, nothing more. <laughs>